Good evening. Hi. Let me, let me adjust the height on this microphone. There we go. That's better. Hi. I'm behind you. Uh, but that's OK. Um, uh, f first thing I want to say is uh, if you're sitting around the perimeter of the room, uh, things will sound much cooler if you're actually under, kind of within the speaker system. So yeah, that's right. Specifically referring to you, man. Uh, yeah, com come on into the, the main seating. And uh, while that's happening, I'll say welcome and hello. Uh, my name is Stefan Moore, and I am very happy and proud to be uh, the concluding speaker in this, uh, this series that's been happening um, over the past uh, several weeks, uh, talking about the, the multi-channel speaker system here at uh, Elastic Arts and uh, talking about how, to, uh, how different folks are approaching making music. Uh, and, and glad to make my, my contribution uh, tonight. Thank you for being here. There's a lot of folks to, to thank. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank the city of Chicago, uh, who provided some amazing funding and possibility for this whole series to happen. Uh, I want to thank uh, Experimental Sound Studio and all the great folks who work there and uh, have uh, facilitated making this happen and being partners in this series. I want to thank Elastic Arts Ben Billington, Adam Zanellini, and all the folks here who uh, have welcomed us into the space and have given uh, the ceiling of this room uh, for the speaker system to live on. Uh, I want to thank uh, Matt Test and Sam Clapp, who are my partners in uh, managing or whatever we do. I don't know if managing is the right verb, but um, putting together this organization called the Chicago Laboratory for Electroacoustic Theater also known as CLEAT, uh, which is uh, how we were able to try and reduce the concept of what these speakers are down to one syllable so we didn't have to say a lot of words all the time. Um, uh, Matt and Sam can't be here tonight, but they are uh, absolutely essential in helping to uh, spread the word about the speaker system and uh, putting together the monthly concert series that we have. The next episode of which is actually taking place this coming Friday. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing somebody, uh, uh, seeing people make music with the speakers as opposed to doing talking, uh, which is mostly what I'll be doing tonight, um, please come back for that. Uh, uh, this Friday and the second Friday of every month to see uh, uh, more of these things that are happening. But more importantly, uh, if you are interested in learning how to use this system, you're interested in making musical experiences of your own with the speaker system, that's what it's here for. And that's ostensibly what I'm talking about tonight is uh, how to get all of you started making things here as well. So if that's something you're interested in, please talk to me. Uh, please talk to Ben, who's back here at the board, um, once we have a chance to wander around and talk to each other. Um, and those of you who brought a computer tonight and want to try hooking it up to the system and making something happen, uh, we'll have plenty of time to do that after I'm, I'm done with this little presentation. So um, yeah, uh, I, I look forward to uh, uh, speaking with all of you and hearing about what you might be interested in doing. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to divide what I'm uh, talking about tonight up into three roughly, I don't know if they're equal sections, I, I didn't time them, but they, they feel equal in my mind. Uh, first of all, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the speakers that are hanging in here because there's something that uh, I get a lot of questions about if I don't talk about it. So. Uh, I want to uh, maybe just show a couple images from the evolution of this particular speaker design and, and talk a bit about how it ended up here uh, and how Cleet ended up here. Uh, and then I want to talk uh, uh, just about a couple techniques for uh, using spatialization, using uh, spatial audio in a kind of a unique uh, speaker configuration like this and uh, some things that I've learn some, some tricks that are uh, kind of fun to play with and that it might be nice to share. 
Uh, and then uh, the last part of what I'll do is talk about uh, the tools that are currently available for uh, all of you to download and work with and uh, just talk a little bit about the, the, the Polkleet uh, ecosystem and process here. Um, and that will probably naturally segue into questions. Uh, in the meantime, if you have questions about things, uh, please feel free to uh, shout them out. Or uh, since we are uh, trying to record these sessions for posterity, there's this microphone at the kind of at the back of the seating area uh, by where that hand is. Thank you, Chris, for your hand. Um, uh, you can uh, uh, speak your question into that microphone. And that will uh, uh, allow your question to be recorded. Otherwise, I can repeat it. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can make this a conversational process as it proceeds. Uh, so yeah, because uh, sometimes questions are a little nicer to ask in the moment when they're relevant as opposed to holding them to the end. So don't hold it in. Um, OK, I'll start. Uh, so yeah. Um, uh, this uh, is a 16-channel speaker system over your head, uh, and these are speakers we call uh, hemisphere uh, speakers. I've been building uh, or kind of working with the building of these speakers for about 20 years now, uh, and they've gone through a lot of changes, and so I thought I would just very quickly show a few uh, uh, early examples of where these came from. Um, the, the original research that led to these speakers uh, before my involvement came from uh, the uh, kind of well-known, amazing uh, composer and technologist uh, Perry Cook and one of his graduate students, Dan Truman, at Princeton University back in the late 90s. They uh, built a couple of these speakers, which they referred to as bombs, uh, because I think they look that way. Uh, that is an IKEA salad bowl. Uh, with uh, holes cut in it and uh, uh, speakers kind of uh, uh, just screwed into it rather crudely. Um, the idea with these uh, original speakers uh, was that um, uh, uh, Perry uh, ha has done a lot of work with uh, physical modeling synthesis, trying to create uh, various instruments uh, um, uh, to synthesize uh, using the actual physics of how instruments work. And so he had a, a violin model and a mandolin model and a few other string instrument models. That, and he was wondering, uh, he and Dan were wondering, um, would it change the effectiveness of the realism of the synthesized sound uh, if you could project the sound in space the same way it would project from the body of an instrument? And so they uh, took a violin and a mandolin and, and various other instruments, and they suspended them in the air, and then they put an array of 12 microphones uh, around uh, uh, the, um, uh, the instruments in kind of a dodecahedron, 12-sided object shape. And so they could catch, capture the, um, the sound coming from the instrument in all directions. And then they would hit the bridge of the instrument with a force hammer and create an impulse and coll collect that impulse from 12 directions and then they would put the sounds back into the speaker with a different sound going to each of the 12 speakers uh, uh, around the full sphere, uh, each one corresponding to the impulse uh, response collected from that direction to try and reproduce the sound of the resonating body of the instrument. Uh, this was a really finicky experiment. And in the end, their conclusion was that it didn't really work, and it was kind of a dumb idea. And they, they, they really didn't want to uh, pursue it any further. Um, and they wrote a paper about it and published it like you do. And then that was sort of it. And the speakers just hung out uh, in, the, in the studio, not being used. Uh, and Dan and one of his colleagues, uh, uh, Curtis Bond, uh, who is a, a bassist, Dan was a violinist, uh, they were very much into building sort of extended instruments that used software to create uh, uh, special uh, uh, kinds of performance uh, energy and electronic sounds using their native uh, instruments as controllers. Uh, and so they started to take these speakers, like sneak these speakers out of the studio because they weren't being used for anything else. 
and to use them playing gigs. And they immediately learned a bunch of interesting things uh, about using speakers that uh, function uh, projecting sound in, in all directions from a single point, uh, which is that you no longer uh, need to have monitor speakers. You're not plugging things into a PA. If there's a hum in the system, it's, you know, it's usually like, well, is that hum my system or is that your system? Okay, I'll turn down. Okay, you turn down. Uh, and trying to troubleshoot that way. Immediately, all of the sound is now coming from your system, almost as though you're playing an acoustic instrument, even though you're playing uh, completely through computers and uh, laptops and electronics. And back in the late 90s, that was a lot more cumbersome of a process than it is right now. Um, but immediately, Dan began to sort of uh, really run with this idea uh, and eventually ended up publishing a dissertation called Alternative Voices for Electronic Sound, uh, which uh, really went into studying and thinking about how uh, the, uh, a speaker like this could uh, really revolutionize the way an instrumentalist thinks about amplifying their sound, you're not using a guitar amp, which points in one direction, you're not using a PA, which kind of fills the space, you're really just amplifying yourself from the point of, uh, of sonic production. Uh, and, and would that allow for the creation of like laptop orchestras and that kind of a thing? So Dan was moving in that direction. Curtis uh, got a job at Rensselaer Polytechnic University, or Institute, sorry, I went there, I should know. Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, um, after he graduated uh, from Princeton. And um, when I became a student there shortly after, uh, Curtis had just received a research grant and said, uh, would I, I wanna build a bunch of these speakers. Uh, you wanna work with me on that? And I was like, sure, sounds great. So that gets us up to about 2002. Um, the first innovation we made was to cut the speakers in half uh, because it makes them a lot less cumbersome to build and a lot less cumbersome to transport and if you ever really need a full sphere, you can always put two of them back to back if you leave the backs flat. Uh, so this is uh, kind of a dimly lit uh, picture of one of the early uh, hemisphere speakers that we built. We built about 60 of them in this first version and we're doing uh, performances, we're doing multi-channel sound installations with them. And this is where I first started to work with these ideas as a, as a graduate student uh, about now. 20 years ago. Um, so I, I can kind of go through the rest of the history. Uh, Dan, uh, when he graduated from Princeton, ended up getting a job teaching there and founded the Princeton Laptop Orchestra in 2006. And I built a bunch of speakers for them because by this point I had been doing a bunch of it and they were very happy to let me uh, do the work of it. Um, in these speakers, we were trying to uh, have the, um, the individual drivers on the speaker all driven separately so that the uh, individual players could choose how to angle their sound, could, could kind of choose the, the way that sound would be projected into the space from their individual points. Uh, but the main thing was that each person is playing a laptop, but they actually have to listen to each other and think about things like ensemble and sort of group listening. Uh, actually, how do you pay attention to a conductor? How do you work? Uh, with the, the laptop as an, as an ensemble instrument. There's no master mix. There's no uh, overall PA control of the sound. Everything is coming out of individual players. And it was, became this real interesting uh, uh, platform for creating a new kind of ensemble music, which now uh, still continues. The Princeton Laptop Orchestra is still uh, uh, happening. And there are now about 80 or 90 laptop orchestras around the world that are active at different, mostly at different uh, educational institutions, uh, which, is, which is kind of fascinating. Here's a, another photo of one of their uh, first concerts uh, set up uh, at, at Princeton on the, uh, on the stage there. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> no, I, I know who David Wessel was, we met, but we never worked together. Yeah, um, at one point in time, I, I was presenting about these at a conference, I think it was 2004, the Seamus Conference at University of Iowa or something like that, and a group of students, a group of graduate students from uh, uh, UC Berkeley uh, approached me and, uh, and Curtis Bond, who was there with me, 
and uh, said, uh, started quizzing us about how we calculated the angles of the speakers and, and how, how the whole you know, sort of cabinet was constructed. And um, they, uh, when, when, they, when they found our answers were not very um, satisfying, they, they, they said to us, well, we're gonna build the perfect version of your speaker. And I said, great. I've never heard from them since then. I know David Wessel is now resting in peace. I don't know what the rest of the folks are doing there, uh, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, okay, oh, were you, were, was that, were you one of those people? <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, fantastic, oh, great, this is good. I was waiting for this conversation to come back. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the, the speakers uh, continue to evolve. Um, I had worked for a while in the late 90s at a company called Polk Audio uh, that uh, is a manufacturer of home and car speakers and I had a good relationship with them so I've been able to, and I'm still able, continue to be able to get uh, uh, sort of high-end car speakers from them. Uh, uh, they went through a phase where everything looked very hubcappy, so the speakers here look very hubcappy. Um, I was also at a conference in New York um, in early 2008. Um, if, the, if this person is here in the audience, I'd also like to talk to you. Uh, uh, someone came over to my table uh, where the speakers were sitting and looked at the sort of circular flange uh, and said, you should cut a handles in this. It'd be much cooler if you cut handles in them. And I was like, wow, you're right. That's a really good idea. And then they walked away. So I have no idea who told me that, but it was a really good idea. So from then on, we did that, uh, and all the speakers. We still do that. Um, here, uh, these are kind of uh, some of the earlier speakers that were uh, uh, put up and uh, donated to a space called Issue Project Room. Uh, starting in 2005, we uh, uh, put uh, an array of speakers on the ceiling, not unlike what we have here, and they stayed uh, uh, on the ceiling there through a couple changes of venue uh, through uh, 2010 when they finally moved to a space where the speakers could no longer be accommodated. Um, but uh, during this time, we had every year a month-long festival of uh, several artists coming through and working with the speakers, and it's where a lot of the software tools uh, that I uh, started to use for multi-channel sound uh, first got developed. Um, this particular concert, by the way, uh, uh, was the opening night of our 2009 um, month-long festival. Uh, and in this concert, there's a, uh, a bassoonist who's kind of hiding back around the corner whose uh, uh, bassoon is covered in 16 uh, different microphones uh, to capture sound coming out of all the different parts of the bassoon. And the idea was that they were going to just improvise on the bassoon and then each of those microphones is routed to a different speaker, so the sound would be naturally spatialized around the room in different shapes according to what notes they were playing, which is pretty interesting. It's an interesting thing about bassoons that sounds comes out of all, all corners and cracks of them depending on which keys are being played. Anyway, that's just trivia. Um, in 2012, uh, I finally decided to call it an actual company. I feel like I'm, I'm always at this moment of trying to decide whether I uh, am tired of doing this and it's not making enough money and I should stop doing it, or if I should you know, go a whole hog and try and advertise, and it just seems like such a niche product, it's very weird. Uh, but it's, it's cool and I consistently sell some to people, so I've just kind of kept it going for a long time. Uh, so we finally came up with like a, a funny corporate identity uh, uh, ISO, ISO Bell is how I think a lot of people think that came about. It's in like equal sound, equal sound level, but really that's just like a Bjork song I like a lot, is that name, which is where that came from. Um, so uh, anyway, there are a few different artists. Anthony McCall uh, 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 started using some of these speakers in uh, sound installation pieces that he was reviving uh, uh, around this time. Also the artist Samson Young, who a few years ago had a great uh, sort of huge show down at the Smart Museum, um, uh, used this. This is a piece called Possible Music Number no. 1, uh, where we did custom speakers without bass flanges and everything was blue, uh, which was a fun process to get a speaker to match a carpet color. Um, uh, I learned a lot about paint 
um, and, and, and powder coating in this process, but this was installed at the Guggenheim uh, Museum in New York City uh, for, uh, for a while in 2018. So these speakers have sort of been taken up by a few different artists and used in, in different ways. Uh, but that kind of brings us, uh, 2018 feels like just before 2019, which feels like just before the pandemic. And so it's basically just smears into today. Uh, and here's, here's the logo for the Chicago Laboratory for Electroacoustic Theater uh, that I was mentioning earlier. Um, over here is the website, uh, cleat.info for uh, the organization. And I'll return here in just a minute to, uh, to talk uh, about uh, what uh, CLEAT is and what we, uh, what we do with it um, and what, what you can do with it. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I, folks often ask about this, the speakers and kind of where they, where they came from. And uh, it's, it's interesting, um, I think electronic musicians have uh, something in common with pianists in the sense that you can't, unless you're, unless you're a certain kind of highly successful pianist, you can't really cart your piano around with you to gigs. If you play the flute, you can pack your flute and uh, unpack it, and everywhere you go, the flute you're playing is your flute. But a pianist has to sort of rely on the piano at the venue, that it's been well cared for, that it's been tuned, uh, and that it has an action that they can work with to try and create the kinds of sounds they want to create. Uh, electronic musicians uh, have the same plight with speaker systems. Um, everywhere uh, you go, if you're working, playing off of a laptop, you're really at the mercy of whatever sound system is already uh, at the space. Um, some places are beloved for electronic musicians to work in because they have uh, really nice sounding uh, sound systems or very flexible sound systems. Um, but it doesn't lead to a situation where uh, we ask a lot of questions about uh, how speakers work. We're, we try and come up with something very standardized. Uh, typically it's stereo, typically a 45 degree dispersion angle out from the speaker. Uh, typically uh, uh, the, the, the sound that you're making uh, has to fit kind of within a certain framework of, of what's expected for, for people to be able to work. And what I loved about these speakers, what I have loved over the years and what keeps me interested in working with them is just that they, they don't project sound in a way that a normal speaker does. Uh, because of uh, all the drivers uh, uh, on the speaker uh, you know, pointing in different directions and sort of covering uh, a large space, uh, you have this sense of, of sound being projected into a room uh, kind of the way uh, uh, an acoustic uh, uh, object is uh, projecting sound into the room. If I, if I clap, sound goes out from my hand in a sphere and bounces off the walls. And you know exactly, if you're listening and I'm in a room with reflective surfaces, you can tell where I am uh, when I clap. Your ears sort of triangulate and uh, are able to uh, uh, tell you where the, where the clap came from. So instead of working with uh, normal stereo panning and image production, which ultimately has kind of a narrow sweet spot and uh, only works for some people in the audience, when you're working with a speaker system like this, all of a sudden you have a bunch of different points uh, that you can uh, send sound into and you can actually just place sound in a space uh, in the place where you want it to go. That's actually outside. I did, I did not just cleverly hit a sound cue right there, although uh, that would be funny. Um, so um, I, I thought tonight I would, uh, uh, I've, I've, in the other talks I've, I've attended, uh, the speakers have uh, shown some uh, work they've created. I thought I would show a little bit uh, of uh, at least a couple of, of compositional ideas, including one uh, piece I'm gonna play right now uh, I, I went and found this patch, uh, uh, Thought Twist at Bailey's is the name of the piece. I first wrote it in 2004 in Max version five, uh, and I opened it up last night uh, for the first time in many years uh, and was delighted to see that it actually still runs in Max eight without any modification, it's kind of amazing. Uh, back in Max five, presentation mode didn't exist, so I, I had to hide everything just by using the, the hide on lock thing, but I have uh, basically just a, a very simple system where I'm gonna take a stereo sound file uh, uh, and play it, 
uh, through a, a bunch of varying delays uh, into the various speakers in the space. Um, so without giving too much more than that away about it, I'll just go ahead and hit play. Uh, the piece is about eight minutes, um, and then uh, uh, we can uh, we can talk a little bit more about what's going on with it afterwards.
thanks. Uh, it's been a little while since I've, I've listened to that one all the way through. Um, it's, uh, it's about a seven and a half minute field recording. I, uh, in, in 2003, I think I was you know, living on the East Coast, but I grew up in Michigan. I came back to visit a friend and uh, was meeting uh, him at a, a, a farmhouse uh, at right at the moment when the first wave of uh, warm weather was coming through at the end of a long winter. And so there was all of this uh, dripping water coming off of the top of the house. And uh, there was sort of a large lawn and uh, a farmhouse nearby and cars sort of passing on the road. And so I, I just brought out my recorder and uh, made a field recording of, uh, of that scene. And at some point in the middle of it, I got up and went to walk around. Uh, and then later on, I was working with the, the speaker system and uh, was putting the, 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 the sound into the system and experimenting with uh, trying to use long delay lines and uh, delay lines that were constantly in motion and trying to uh, uh, see what would happen if I, I just over a long time brought a, a field recording from a space of being uh, very far spread out, multiple copies of the same file being spread out, uh, brought them all into convergence with one another uh, where they, so there's that point at the middle where I take the first step and you can hear my, my shoe crunching on the snow um, uh, that's the moment when uh, all of the timing converges. And so there's this interesting feeling of, uh, uh, of time converging from all of these different directions in one spot that kind of feels like this spiral that twists in and grabs you, sort of congeals into the moment, and then after about 10 seconds just begins to quickly spiral back out and move in the opposite direction. And I got really interested in this feeling of uh, the same sound being delayed by different amounts going to different speakers. And so this was, uh, this is sort of a, a the idea of, of uh, kind of having a question, like what would happen if I did this? And then kind of building a piece out of, of those kinds of uh, questions and inquiries, uh, which is the, the same thing I, I honestly see people doing uh, all the time when they're coming in here to work now on the speakers. There's sort of a bunch of questions that are posed uh, to artists when they're working uh, in, a, in a very different speaker situation like this one. Um, but I think every, every artist working feels a different set of questions that relate to their own practice and, and what they're doing. And that's a big part of the fun of, uh, of having this here is getting to see how those, those questions kind of play out and where people are, are led to with them. So, uh, oh yeah, sure. It was a really cool piece. Um, it's interesting listening to footsteps that are coming from above you. Yeah. And I was and was that piece originally made for a stereo system or was it for a, a like a system in the sky? Uh, it was a system that was hanging. Um, I I, uh, I originally um, had that field recording and I liked the I liked the way that the the drips of water were captured. I liked the the, the clarity of of the recording. I thought it worked out really well. Uh, but I hadn't thought of using it in a piece or making a piece out of it until I put it in uh, a 16-channel speaker system that I was, one of the early versions of the speaker system that I was using at that time. Um, there was a time in 2004 before the uh, speaker system was installed at Issue Project Room when I was working with a group of artists led by Andrea Poli at a place called Hunter College in Manhattan. And uh, over the summer, they had a, a, a TV studio with a really good like uh, uh, grid you could hang things from that was unused for the summer, and they kind of let me go in and mess around in there. So I hung a bunch of speakers in the air and uh, started composing music, and then invited a bunch of other composers in to also uh, do things. And then we had kind of a weekend of showing of works at the end of that, and this was the piece I showed uh, from that initial uh, experiment. Uh, so. Uh, and it was even fun at that moment to see how other people were reacting to it. But but yeah, the idea, um, I kind of like that weird perspective of the footsteps being above you. It, it does it does sort of present that question for the listener of like, are you under the ground listening to what's going on above? Or what, where exactly is all, where are you in relationship to all these things that are happening? Uh, which is one that I kind of enjoy. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so just to talk about that for uh, a, a quick second, 
uh, uh, longer, or just to stay on that idea. Um, I, I'll warn you that I, I, I did absolutely the smartest thing one can do the, the day one is presenting, which is I installed a new version of Max uh, on my laptop. Actually installed it before I taught a Max class this morning. Uh, it ran fine during that, and then just about five minutes before uh, a lot of you started arriving, uh, there were these sort of loud bursts of noise it was producing, and I looked and I saw that today, since my morning class, Cycling 74 issued an update to Max, uh, and I thought, well, maybe these glitches are part of this update, so I reinstalled a new version of Max yet again, uh, version 8.51, uh, about 10 minutes before I started talking. So, um, uh, I don't know, this was making really n loud, horrible noises earlier, so if that happens, I'll stop it. Um, but, uh, I know, be warned. It's probably fine. So I, I created a little um, uh, a patch here to just to illustrate this idea of um, uh, um, using multiple delays or sending one sound to multiple locations and then uh, sort of playing with delays. And this is a, a version of, of that idea uh, that I, I find works with um, a psychoacoustic phenomenon we call a precedence effect. Precedence effect is the idea that um, if a sound arrives, that, that, that when, when, we're, when we're trying to localize sound, when we're trying to tell where a sound is coming from, um, we will uh, pay attention to which ear it's louder in, which ear it has the right sort of filter profile in. If, if it seems more muffled in one ear than the other, then it's probably coming from the direction of the less muffled ear, because that is the ear that's listening to the sound without a head in the way uh, of it. Um, but uh, also, we, we pay uh, attention to uh, a sort of what we call interaural uh, timing differences. The amount of time that it takes a sound to travel from one side of your head to the other side of your head uh, is a, you know, about, a, about a millisecond or so in, in normal air. So um, uh, our brains are trying to decode location also to, uh, based on the, the, these timing differences. And so it's kind of fun to take a sound. Here, I'll... I'll uh, I'll, I'll just load a sound. I was working with this one earlier uh, at half speed. I'll just play it. This is, this is me kind of messing with a, uh, I think it was like a pack of gum, like a blister pack. I'm just crunching the plastic and I'm playing it back a little slow here, but it makes a nice kind of sound texture to work with. I'm playing it at like half speed. And right now it's playing into all the speakers at exactly the same time. So you're hearing this kind of very flat image of this sound coming through all the speakers at once. If I start to introduce a small randomized amount of delay into each of the speakers, which I'm about to do, uh, here, I'll just do it. Now it sounds like the sound is moving around the room. Although if each of you were to try and point to where the sound is moving to, it would be a different place for each of you. And what's going on here is just that the sound is coming out, there's about um, somewhere between zero and 20 milliseconds difference in how the sound is arriving at each of the speakers. And because of that, each of you is getting a slightly different uh, take on where the sound is based on how the sound is arriving differently to your right and left ear. Uh, and of course, once you've built a system like this, you can begin abusing it. Now it just sounds kind of like it's chattering. And here it actually just sounds like it's splintering across the room.
is kind of being atomized and sprinkled around the room in different ways. And of course, this behaves differently with speech or with pitched material. Anyway, the point, the point is that this kind of, a, of effect is uh, uh, sort of diff difficult to reproduce on a normal stereo or even a normal surround speaker system. Uh, but in a situation like this where you have a, a bunch of different point sources for uh, a, a sound in different places throughout the room, uh, you all of a sudden can really start to play in a granular way with uh, location and the locatability of sound. And that's some of the bigger questions that sort of opened up for me uh, uh, working with this system. So this is a little max patch and all this is doing is the sound is being played uh, going out to uh, these 16 different uh, uh, delay uh, uh, tap outs. And then in each case, there is a randomizer and that randomizer is being multiplied by a coefficient that I'm, I'm setting up here. So the randomizer in each situation is working a little, a little differently. Uh, and then everything's just going out individually to each of the, the 16 speakers here, which is what this part is about. And we've managed to run without uh, making loud, glitchy noises, which is, I'm just grateful for that. Um, okay, uh, here, save, sure. Um, so, so what I, I want to talk about now, uh, just to sort of uh, 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 close all of this and came lead to the next area of discussion and questions, is just to talk a little bit about the Chicago Laboratory for Electroacoustic Theater. Um, uh, in conversation with uh, 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 Matt Test and Sam Clapp, who were both uh, students at the Sound Arts and Industries uh, uh, Master's Program at Northwestern University, where I teach, uh, Matt and Sam both had really interesting ideas about experimental music and were both kind of involved in the Chicago scene in different ways. And the three of us uh, were just talking about having a, a place where we like sort of more creative multi-channel electronic music could be uh, uh, presented or trying to find kind of a home for that. And originally we were trying to put together some kind of a storefront situation and most storefront situations are kind of acoustic disasters. And we had some very funny uh, real estate adventures that are not worth detailing here. But eventually uh, we had the good fortune to meet uh, the folks here at uh, Elastic Arts and uh, strike a deal with them where the speakers could live here and people could have access to them. And this is sort of the best of all possible worlds for what we were hoping because uh, uh, Elastic is such a warm place and there's uh, such a, an interesting intersection of various music communities who come through here. Uh, and it's no doubt the reason that many of you are aware of this and uh, are, are here tonight. And so we're, we're super glad to be, um, well, it's, we're coming up on three years of the system being installed here. It was actually first installed in November of 2019 uh, but it spent a long time sitting on the ceiling doing nothing because of this uh, global pandemic thing that happened. But uh, we've been running monthly shows since uh, January of this year, uh, and we're, we're really excited about that. Um, and we put up this website uh, that has some, some information on it. Uh, one of the things that it has is a, uh, a little bit of information about who we are, I guess, yeah. Uh, um, kind of an already outdated events page. Uh, but the important thing is this uh, resources page uh, that um, we're in the middle of, of, of finishing editing a, 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 a video that's sort of a video walkthrough for how to get uh, hooked into the system. There is an operation manual that actually gives you just some basic information about where the channels are in the room, uh, how the little patch bay in our rack back here works, and some information about how to uh, get yourself going uh, on the system. Um, but uh, there's also uh, a link to the Mark of the Unicorn uh, uh, drivers that you uh, would need to connect your computer to the system and uh, uh, some sample patches in Macs for those of you who, who use Macs to, to try and get going with, uh, with this. And so I thought it would be fun to just quickly demo those. Um, this is what you get when you get the max starter code. Uh, there's a patch here, which is just uh, the simplest of pink noise generator tests. Uh, 
This is just to make sure that all the speakers are in fact working and uh, are all sort of more or less calibrated to the same level. Uh, if, they, if it sounds good, it is good. Uh, this is to the subwoofer, which is up there at the front of the room. Okay, so that's not the most exciting one musically, but it's good to have it because uh, it makes sure that things will work. And then uh, we have this uh, ability to uh, 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 travel sound uh, around the room. I'll just I'll make this one a little bigger so you can see it. Uh, but this is a kind of a um, just a two-dimensional uh, uh, panning uh, uh, device. Uh, I'm gonna actually get rid of this and replace this with a. Um, Nice low sawtooth wave. So as the uh, algorithm there moves it around, it's actually panning it around and kind of trying to do sort of a smooth crossfade between speakers so you actually get a sense of, 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 of this uh, moving in space. Um, I can. copy of that and <laughs> so this is just a, a very uh, quick and easy way to start doing this you can also turn the uh, the wandering part of the patch off and just sort of manually move it around by hand to create whatever shapes you want to create in the air. Uh, and then there are a, a couple of other ones like this. There's, there's one that's similar that is set up to uh, uh, do a, uh, we'll call this one the orbiter, uh, set up to do sort of natural circles in the space. So you can get uh, sounds moving around. I can make them move faster. I can make the radius of the circle smaller. I could probably easily also offset the circle and have it rotate in different parts of the room and have it go counterclockwise. So uh, another way to control uh, space. Uh, uh, and then this one's kind of fun. Um, oh, I must have saved that as a bigger thing. Cool. Uh, this is just a click object in Max being run through a resonant filter that's being randomized. So I can simulate rain. I can make it go faster. It doesn't really sound like rain all that much. But I'm, not, I'm not trying to fool you. It's completely synthesized. But it's fun to, uh, to realize that you can execute spatialization moves this, this quickly. That's all one sound generating unit that is kind of uh, all over the room at once. I guess I could probably uh, start up another one. Lots of rain. This will be the louder rain. This will be the quieter rain. I know. Wait, is this one not working? Oh, well. I probably did something to break it. OK. Anyway, the, that's a great point to sort of uh, uh, move on to the end of, of my talk. Um, uh, we're really interested. Uh, I'll speak on Matt and Sam's behalf as well as myself. We're very interested in uh, uh, creating community around multi-channel uh, experimental work, uh, inviting in people who have all different kinds of practices and ideas about how to use a system like this and, uh, uh, and trying to get it to happen. 
Uh, I have studiously avoided looking at any uh, election returns information, so I'm still in a good mood right now. Um, and pl please, please don't, yeah, please don't, if you have bad news, please save it, take it somewhere else. Um, uh, uh, but, but, you know, in, in, in moments like this, it's really uh, uh, more important than ever uh, to have community around uh, making uh, beautiful and uh, uh, crazy things. Uh, and putting them into the world and sharing them with each other. And that's, that's sort of the, the spirit behind this. So um, with that thought and that spirit, I'll end uh, uh, the sort of the formal part of my presentation. If there's anybody who has questions that they want to ask before we kind of disintegrate into smaller conversations, this would be a great time for that. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I will leave the rest of this page blank for a moment to see if anyone has a thing. Yes? Um, I have a question. Why is that, why is it called the Queer Art Museum? That's a great question. Uh, the question is why are there uh, a couple of, there's actually two speakers up there that are, that are flat against the ceiling uh, and, why, and the rest are hanging lower. Um, we originally hung them all lower uh, and then discovered that they were conflicting with the projector uh, and so they were casting a little bit of a shadow and that was annoying uh, to people who wanted to use the projector, which, hey, I, I get it. So we, uh, every time we wanted to use the system, we had to get the ladder out and back and uh, rehang the speakers. And, um, and then uh, we had to remove the speakers at the end of our rehearsal session. And it just, it took, uh, it took a lot of effort and it didn't really feel safe for a person, like one person alone to be up on a ladder moving a speaker, and then we had an incident where somebody dropped a speaker and it was damaged and we had to fix it. And it just, yeah, eventually it was just like, why don't we just hang these closer to the ceiling? <laughs> and so um, it, it turns out I, I don't really feel a huge difference. Uh, I, was, I was concerned at first that there might be kind of an image problem uh, with the, the plane not seeming to be uh, uh, quite uh, uh, right on, but uh, fortunately, our ears are pretty forgiving when it comes to sound localization. So uh, this was a situation where we we've, were able to get away with it and uh, coexist peaceably with the projector and not find ourselves doing strange things on ladders at weird times of day. So yeah, that's a that's a great question. Sure. It is absolutely possible to, to do it. And uh, uh, had I wanted to make sort of a bigger production out of this, I would have done something like I did uh, last month uh, when I, I did a short opening set for our no November, October, October concert. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I got my month straight. Um, uh, where I actually had a live mic uh, coming from an oscillating fan. Actually, no, that was, that was just a straight non-oscillating fan that I was jamming objects into. Uh, and then spatializing that sound uh, uh, throughout the room. Um, we've had uh, uh, instrumentalists play uh, uh, into microphones, into the system. We've had uh, uh, vocal stuff happen into the system. Uh, the, and, hmm? and in, in, in live sets, uh, people playing uh, uh, live electronics in, in various ways. We uh, can use the normal uh, uh, elastic sound system to route uh, uh, sounds through the mixing board into the cleat system and then out to the, to the speakers. And uh, we've been able to do it uh, kind of with uh, shockingly little danger of uh, uh, feedback, which seems like it would be a, a big problem in a space like this, but actually, actually has turned out to mostly work out pretty well. So yeah, that's absolutely a possibility. And uh, one of the things that's covered in that uh, manual in the, 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 the cleat uh, uh, site is uh, actually how to route, uh, yeah, using the patch bay here, how to route signals th uh, into the board and then out of the board through our little patch bay into the, the sound system and have them show up in Ableton or, or Logic or Reaper or Max or whatever software you're using to, uh, to create the, the uh, spatialization. Yeah, you do. You do need a, com a computer at this point, or somebody needs a computer. You can't. You 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 
I guess we could we could patch things straight to a speaker uh, if we wanted to, but it would be it's usually done with some kind of a software, even if it's just setting up uh, a channels going straight to speakers and leaving it. Yeah. Uh, Greg, and then over there. Yeah. Yeah, I got a question. Um, you know, Max is not not really good if you want to do. Uh, it doesn't have a friendly timeline, let's put it that way. Whereas Ableton does, and there's a lot of things you can do with clips, but then Ableton is really stunted in how you can route signals. So um, the question is, is there some sort of a utility that you can use to um, actually create an aggregate device uh, that you can use as, as an output device in Ableton that you can feed into Max? Uh, you absolutely could set it up to send from Ableton, uh, send out of Ableton into something like uh, Soundflower or Black Hole, uh, and then receive those signals in Max and send out of Max into uh, the system. That's absolutely. Black Hole uh, multi-channel. Yes, yeah, it's it's absolutely possible to do that. Um, the, another way to do it would be to. Uh, use Max to write a Max for Live uh, multi-channel output routing device and then send into the speakers that way. There are a few, a few different ways to I, I don't think Max for Live works, works uh, it, it, where you can stick it in a clip because any all the Max for Live things are restricted to stereo outs. Uh, yeah, but you can, you can go ahead and just put a DAC tilde 1316 in it and ignore that and it will function. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 not uh, it's against the rules, quote unquote. But you know, it it Great. works. It works, um, and uh, um, yeah. I, in, in terms of like what the what the right way is to do that, there probably is one. Um, uh, but yeah, I I have found that you can just ignore the whole structure of Ableton and take, for example, one of these patches that I just demonstrated and put something like that into a uh, a Max for Live um, effect and th drop that onto a track. Great. So yeah, uh, I, I but don't take my word for it. I encourage you to try it. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you mentioned that you can automatically send out other people out of the um, I, I don't know of any systems that are quite like this using this kind of speaker, which I think has a different sort of uh, spatialization. Uh, philosophy that it's working with. Most things are, are kind of surround uh, uh, sound. Uh, sometimes you end up with uh, these sort of massive choirs of speakers, like the, the Beast system, the Birmingham uh, Electroacoustic Sound Theater, um, which I think we're, we're, we're nodding to a little bit in, in our name. Um, there just aren't many systems uh, or, or spaces in the US especially that are multi-channel spaces that are uh, existing outside of academic institutions. Uh, so there's a huge problem that uh, folks who are getting degrees or doing research within universities are kind of presenting to the people in those communities. And then when they, when they graduate, they get out and they don't have places to share the work that they're making or to c continue to explore those ideas unless they keep doing that research. Um, the, the big exception to this is uh, in, um, I think just outside New York City, uh, there's a place called the Honk Tweet. I think it's in, it's in New Jersey, run by Wolfgang Gill. Um, in, uh, in San Francisco, there's a space called Envelop, which is a 24 channel um, uh, space for uh, ambisonic uh, sound projection. And just a couple weeks ago, I visited a place called Black Hole. No, uh, no relationship to the audio uh, uh, software uh, that uh, has a kind of a 14-channel system, very idiosyncratic 14-channel system, run by Micah Silver, um, where one can go and listen to and and, and make work. Um, but there are sort of precious few of of these places that exist. Um, but hopefully. I don't know if we just keep doing it, more people will do it. Um, yeah, that's. But this is this is a big reason why. I mean, I, I teach at a university, and I and I I'm, I I love what the university environment in, engenders and what it's able to afford people. But I see people graduate all the time, and then 
lose access to those facilities. And so it's, it's important to me to try and have something that maybe has more of a community life outside of that world and has more of a kind of a longevity where somebody could consider developing a relationship with it over a longer period of time. So that's, that's these are all uh, part of the reason why, why this is here and, and why we're doing this. So thanks. Yes. Doing, uh, uh, run that by me one more time. Trying to do to what to create the. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, I mean, absolutely, we've, we've done stuff like that. There's a, um, uh, back when this uh, system, a version of this system lived the Issue Project Room, uh, there was a musician named Miguel Frasconi who uh, came up with the idea of doing uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, uh, finding 16 different recordings of, of the Rite of Spring and having each one in a different uh, speaker. And then you could hit play and it would play the first movement in all speakers at the same time, and they would all start out together and then kind of drift out of, uh, out of uh, relationship with each other, and then when that would come to an end, you could start the second track and so on. Um, and a as I mentioned in that one photo I had up there earlier, uh, we had 16 individual microphones all on one bassoonist, but you know, in different parts to, to kind of create a, a spatial embodied feeling of the, the, the bassoon being exploded into the space. But um, if you've got a particular idea for something that would be cool, let's talk. Because, um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's sort of feels like there's really no bottom to the, to the well uh, on, of what kinds of ideas could be done here. And if there's a specific thing you're thinking of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm already convinced it's probably cool and we should probably try it. So. Okay, well, you, you let me know. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your attention and for being here. Yeah. We have a number of folks who are here who have already presented work in the system. So uh, if, if you're trying to talk to me about it and um, you uh, uh, can't get to me because there's other people, uh, do talk to, to Bill Parade over here, talk to Ben Billington who's uh, worked with the system, uh, uh, talk to uh, a number of the other folks who are floating around. Also, uh, I'm just gonna do this real quick. If you are now or have ever been uh, uh, in the SAI program at, uh, at Northwestern. Can you raise your hand? Yeah, okay, there's a, <laughs> a chunk of you. And many of you don't know each other because you're all from different cohorts, so uh, uh, go around and find each other now and say hi. Um, cool, thanks so much, everybody. And if you want to try plugging your computer into the system, please come back here and we can do that. Uh, otherwise, uh, enjoy your evening.